so you, I mean, your day job, right? Your in and out is in the TBM. Uh, tell us about the plane you're flying. I know you said you recently got it repaired. Yeah. Uh, so my full-time job, I fly for a private company out of Miami, Opelika. It's a TBM 850, single engine turbo prop for those who don't know that. And it's a 2006 model. I mean, so it's not the newest airplane in the sky, but uh, yeah. So the other day I had a uh, took off and I, my pressurization totally went out as after I rotated. Oh. So I was like, okay, okay, I was just going to St. Pete from Miami, which is a 45 minute flight. So I'm like, okay, I, beautiful day. I got to get to Boston. So I'll just stay low. And, you know, I think it was at like 8,500 feet just to get there. And then when I was coming into land, uh, I cleared the land. I put the landing gear handle down, nothing. And I'm like, oh. Oh. Uh, and I had the boss on board, the one boss that hates huh. flying. Ooh. So I'm like, for all the people to be on board, you yeah. know, that was not the flight to have all this going on. So mm. I, you know, I tried again, the landing gear handled, nothing again. So I contacted the tower and I, I said, you know, tower, uh, clear St. Pete tower. I got, I'm not, my landing gear is not coming down. And they said, well, go for a low pass and we'll verify. So yeah, I did the low pass. Uh, mm. And I said, yeah, uh, 851 Tango Bravo, your landing gear is not down. So I went missed and I figured let's just declare an emergency and I, I don't want to have to deal with uh, normal, you know, pilot duties of uh, airplane that's not having issues. I have to focus on emergency checklist. I, you know, I don't know the whole outcome of this. So there's no hurt in declaring an emergency when you got something like this going on. So they put me into radar vectors. I pulled out the emergency checklist and once a year you go to training, you know, I go to Simcom once a year and you practice this maneuver every year. And it was just like I was in the simulator. I didn't, you don't panic. You'd go with that checklist. At the same time, in my mind, I'm like, I really hope this works like it does in the sim and actually works out. But uh, sure enough, I had the uh, landing gear checklist, you know, completed. I manually pumped the landing gear down within, I'd say, three, four minutes. I returned right back around in for a nice smooth landing. And, you know, on short final, they said, yes, your uh, landing gear appears to be down. But due to good training, uh, an emergency that could go the other direction when it goes a good way. Just always take your training seriously and it pays Absolutely. off in the real world. You know, that's what the training is all about. You know, I tell people you really learn how to fly, especially like in these Cessnas in the first 10, 20 hours, like you can fly the plane after that. It's uh, of course, navigation, communications and safety, 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 safety. It's all what happens in case of this? What happens in case of that? What if you do this? What if you do that? That's what all the trains for. And I was reading an interesting one, which is, you know, there's very few other careers where your job is on the line every six months, right? Not only for, for the sim, but also for the medical. <laughs> yeah. Right? So like every six months you show up and either you keep your job or you don't. And that's kind of crazy, but you know, we do it. We love it. It's, it's what we know how to do. Um, so we'll bring it back to your situation. The TBM is such a modern, sophisticated machine, which I don't even know how many computers and systems on board, but when it comes down to it, I, I want to say it's like a manual pump or a crank to get your gear down, right? Yeah. What it is, is you go through a bunch of little steps, but there is in between the two seats up front, there's a floor hatch you'll pull out. And after you get to the step of where you're going to be doing this, there's a manually pump that you pump. And he, he, I was at about 40, 45, and still nothing was happening, you know, 45 pumps. And I, you can go up to like 65 is where it should eventually happen. And it was right around 45 or so is where it finally hit. And I got the three green. But when I was getting close, you know, farther into that procedure, I'm like, you know, I didn't feel any pressure. Like in the simulator, this is where it's a little different. In the simulator, you start to feel more pressure on the, the pump handle. And okay. in the real world, there was no pressure at all until yeah. the very ending. Huh. So I, that's where I did get a little bit nervous thinking, well, what if this isn't really working, but it worked yeah. out perfect. And what the issue was, so I'll tell you what's even harder is getting a ferry permit from the FAA. So I had to fly the airplane from St. Pete to uh, Pompano where the maintenance facility is. And, you know, it's a broken airplane. So yeah. I, to get the ferry permit, you got to go online and it's, it's a whole bunch of steps you got to fill all up mm. and you got to get a mechanic to look at the airplane. And uh, so it, it, was, it took about 24 hours for me to get it approved. So, you know, I had to get a hotel room and there's a whole bunch of stipulations in that ferry permit. Like a mechanic had to come go look at the airplane. 
uh, you have to fly it with the circuit breaker pop, the landing gear circuit breaker. Uh, the gear has to remain down the entire flight. Like they, they list out everything that's a, and necessary for you to be able to fly that airplane on that ferry permit to get it fixed. So that that's the yeah. steps of how it all worked. Yeah, that's well. I'm I'm glad you got it down safe. And you, I think. So did you have? Did uh did Dyer have a mechanic come out there to St. Pete to see it? Did you go with somebody that was on the field? To just I went with somebody on the field. Nightingale Aviation. It's this uh, shop right next to uh, Signature uh, Flight Support there at St. Pete, and I've used them. I'm going to tell you what, I think I've got bad luck at St. Pete. <laughs> Every time I go there, I get stuck. Last time I was there, my generator failed, <laughs> and I was stuck there for oh, like no. four days. So is it Albert uh, Whittick or the north side, the St. Pete? It's a St. Pete Clearwater International. All right. I've only ever flown into Albert Whittick on the south side. Um, oh, yeah, that's a cool little airport. Beautiful airport with a hangar restaurant, and you're landing right over the bay, and the sailboats are right there. Dolly Museum's next door. My cousin lives yeah, right beautiful. there. That's why I go there. Um but yeah, so bad luck in the Bay Area, huh? Every time I go there, I, I, something ma- massively breaks down on the airplane. So, and so I used the same mechanic as the last time I was there when something broke down bad, which was the generator. I mean, it's good to have you know someone you trust, someone who's friendly uh, to go out and check things for you. Um, so, so sorry I came across it, but the airplane's airworthy now. You're back to flying. Yeah, yeah we got took it back to Opelika the other day, and uh, tomorrow I think I'm going up to Tennessee, maybe. So we'll see what happens. Nice. Excellent. So again, for people that don't know the TBM 850, it's just a beautiful beast of a plane, PT-6. It's a, the fastest single-engine turboprop aircraft on the market, right? Or at least now the TBM family is. Now it's the 960. Um, but I was impressed because I think someone compared it to me. You don't really understand how fast it is until you realize that it, I've been told and confirm me if, correct me if I'm wrong, that it can fly from Miami to New York in three hours, like a 737. Is that about right? Uh, Miami to New York, it would probably be about three hours and 45 minutes or four hours, depending on the routing and weather. But, um, yeah. it's, yeah, you, we've taken it from Miami nonstop right to Chicago. Uh, so yeah, it's got a good range for a single engine airplane and good, you know, good speed. And fast, you know, cause that's what an airliner would take to get up there. And, uh, and you know, it's a six seater, right. And, and just like yeah. the, uh, it's interesting that you have it in this um, uh, fractional kind of shared ownership because it, um, it's it's kind of an owner-operator plane for the most part. So you meet these really interesting people that not only uh, can fly their own plane, but you know, in order to afford a three, four million dollar plane, you've got to be doing something really interesting. So <laughs> they're all like business owners, uh, law- I think lawyers, doctors. Is that what you're flying? Uh, yeah, I just fly. Uh- company employees of the private company that I fly, but you know, they own the airplane. They, you know, they have it. Me just fly to the company employees around. It's beautiful. So it's beautiful. I don't get to meet strangers. I, I know everybody I fly because it's That's all. Nice. Just... Yeah. So you got some nice uh, camaraderie and network going on there. Um, so we mentioned this right before the, we started recording. I've had a lot of airline captains. We had Captain Alfaro, the Miami International Chief for American Airlines here uh, just last month. We've had a lot of airline captains, but we really haven't had a lot of corporate executive pilots. And that's- I love, uh, yeah, I love the lifestyle of what I do, the corporate lifestyle. I, to me, I like being in the, uh, it's a better quality of life to me. I just think it's a lot more fun being able to go into the little FBOs around the country or, you know, the world wherever you fly to. and. Yeah, you don't have to deal with the mass big international airports and the terminals with all thousands of people. I just like it being a little bit more low key. It's a really a lot of fun this type of lifestyle. It is, and over the last uh, you know two three years of the pandemic, while well, the airlines took a big step back, and they're back like one hundred and ten percent now. But what grew dramatically was, of course, cargo and executive travel. Anyone that was that could afford it and really was on the fence about it before, they went for that, you know, NetJets membership or EXO or whatever it is, or bought into fractionals. And there's just been this balloon in business aviation. Um, now, I know you work for, for uh, a, a private owner, a private group, but I imagine you've seen that flying into all these FBOs around the country. Oh, yeah, for sure. The FBOs have gotten so much busier. Like Banyan back in the pandemic there, they said they had their record fuel sales for, you know, Jet A, wow. Jet Fuel, that they've ever had. It's like these FBOs are, you know, I've t- I talked to all the pilots and they say, yeah, they 
their schedules are so busy because it, everybody's flying corporate now if they can afford it. Yeah, it's really interesting, you know, and as, as we, uh, you know, climb, climb out of the pandemic, you know, it's, there's still strains and everyone's getting sick and I've got some family members that are under the weather right now. And I'm like, well, you know, just stay home. But, um, it, I think that's one of the legacies that's going to go off. There's been like this growth in corporate aviation. I don't think it's going to go away. You know, it might be tamped down by the economics and all that, but uh, I think it's going to stay pretty strong. Yeah. Yeah, I believe so too. So I'm really curious about your route to get into that executive seat because, like I said, a lot of people know. I mean, the flight school here. We like to say that we've carved out a path, you know, through the woods of flight training, and uh, you know, get to, be to being a flight instructor and off into our airline partners. But a lot of people don't want to be flight instructors, have zero interest in being flight instructors. We've had some students have great success going off and doing other things. And because it takes a certain kind of person, personality, patience to work with students and, and, and teach them. So it's a, it's a great and kind of proven track for, for that we've developed to have our graduates kind of build the time to go to the airlines. Uh, but I understand you didn't follow that track. You kind of went into into the industry on your own yeah uh, well i went to flight school at Fort Lauderdale executive airport at airborne systems they're not even in business anymore oh, i'm gonna tell you right now i wish yeah. i wish that yeah. uh i had wayman aviation i wish i would your facilities there at north perry are amazing to me like when i've, I've taken a tour of everything and uh, i would love to have had a flight school like with you and i was uh, doing my training but yeah I, I didn't even plan on doing it for flying as a career i got the Montgomery GI Bill being in the Coast Guard, which paid for 60% of all my flight training after the private pilot license. So I used that to get all my ratings just you know because I liked flying. And then one day I found out at Fort Lauderdale International here, they were hiring first officers on Fairchild Metroliners. And I applied and got a job as a co-pilot at 400 hours. And I, I told you earlier, I mean, I didn't know what I was doing at 400 hours. I think I think no. the limits should definitely be higher for that. <laughs> but uh, and well, which they are now. Well, it's funny because you talk to people, and most people tell you that at, at about 500 hours is when they started feeling comfortable in a plane, right? Yeah. Like we can get in and you kind of know your way around. Uh, we were joking, you can't even find the on switch at 400 <laughs> hours. And you get a commercial license at 200, 250 hours, right? So there's still quite a learning curve there. Um, so you learn to fly airborne systems. All your, all your ratings there in Fort Lauderdale Executive? Yeah, for all exact same flight school throughout all my ratings, right. and uh, you know, I just I started flying as a first officer, and well, then you know, I went to Saab three forties after that, nice. and then one day I decided to, it was uh, that was uh, part one twenty one flying, and then one day I was like, well, I, I got a job offer to fly corporate, you know, like charter right. jobs out of a uh, same four auto executive, so then I switched over to ch- corporate probably like two years into flying for one twenty one, so. And a lot of people ask, well, how did you get from that 200, 250 hours to 400? Was that just going out and weekend flying and renting and time building? Yeah, it'd be me and my friends. We'd all go out and uh, fly around, just keep flying for fun. You know, we just had a blast right. flying around Florida, go get lunch or place at different yeah. places and stuff. And uh, $100 hamburgers. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's, oh, so that's excellent. All right. So. You come across opportunity at 400, and I have to tell you, I'm seeing more and more kind of like five, like people kind of getting picked up at 500 hours for SIC, second in command, right? Um, so, for example, the TBM is not, doesn't doesn't require a second pilot, right? Um, is there opportunity for someone to fly an SIC on a TBM or anything like that? Um, with me, uh, no, I couldn't do that with my job, but, uh, I mean, a climb to three, five, com is an employment aviation employment site that I direct a lot of people to, uh, for different flying gigs, you know, co-pilot stuff, you know, like makers there out of Fort Lauderdale right now, they advertise on it. Yeah. Water, they switched to uh makers there now. These oh, they're makers. Water makers. Okay. And they're hiring co-pilots on the caravans, which is an amazing opportunity for someone to get into the caravans and fly as a co-pilot. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, well, so- Rob over at Tropic Ocean, same thing, caravans and flying all around the Caribbean. And I think you, you that was the corporate you were talking about, right? You've got to, got to do all that Caribbean flying. Oh, yeah. I've, got, I've been to almost every island in the Bahamas you can think of that has a runway. Um, I mean, what was amazing is they, uh, the Bahamian people, I love their culture out there, and they made me a flying ambassador to the Bahamas. 
probably oh, I think like cool. three, four years ago. And they had a really cool ceremony out there at Freeport for me. Yeah, I feel so privileged and happy to be part of their, you know, community out there. What does it entail to be an ambassador, a flying ambassador for the Bahamas? You basically are there to help guide people along. It's on the government website, it mm -hmm. lists all the different flying uh, ambassadors. And you can reach out to them and they'll help guide you along to fly your airplanes if you want to fly out there, you know, privately or anybody that has questions, we're there to answer them for them. Sure. And then just also to help promote, you know, general aviation in the Bahamas.